Good morning. Great to see you. My name is Luke. I'm one of the pastors here, uh, part of our preaching team. And if you're feeling like, gosh, I could use a little more elbow room, <laughs> you're not alone in this room. It's pretty snug. Uh, if only we had a new building to move into that was bigger. Oh, wait, we do. And so that's happening uh, four Sundays from now. On June 2nd will be our soft opening uh, right next door. If you're brand new with us, you've heard us mention this a few times. We own that property that's being, uh, that's actually done being constructed and we're uh, preparing to move in. So we've got three Sundays left in this room and then we'll move in there and we'll start inviting people and then it'll get filled again. And that's just how God works. And so we're excited for that. We will have a grand opening as well the end of the summer. Um, but uh, this week and next week, we'll finish Jonah. And then that last Sunday in this space will be really stripped down. The stage will be gone. Uh, most of the lighting will be gone. There, we'll still have seats. Um, but we'll have a short service. And then we'll actually do an open house over at the space next door and let you explore and move around there uh, as we prepare for that soft opening on June 2nd. So that's what's coming. Uh, we're in this series in the book of Jonah, and Jonah is most well known for what happens at the end of chapter 1 and chapter 2, which is that the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. If you are familiar at all with the biblical story of Jonah, that's what you think of. Jonah, fish. Jonah, whale, maybe is how you were taught. There's no Hebrew word for whale, so it's just fish. Uh, but... That's what gets the attention of Jonah, and yet there's actually something even more kind of impressive, right? This reminds me of my, my late friend, Tom Schrader, who uh, pastored and, and was a mentor to me and a great friend to me. He, he had this other friend who had won multiple gold medals in the Olympics and had also won a silver medal. And so Tom would introduce him and say, hey, have you met my friend? He won a silver medal in the Olympics. <laughs> And I just, I always love that. That was just such Tom's sense of humor, right? Because if you're that guy, what are you going to say? Well, 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 actually, I won gold medals too, right? I mean, you just, you're not going to say that. And yet, when you say, hey, you won a silver medal, like, that's really impressive in and of itself. But there's much more to that story, right? That's how I feel about Jonah. You say, hey, Jonah was swallowed by a fish. It's like, whoa. I mean, that's honestly kind of hard to believe. If you have any kind of skepticism about the Bible this is where it goes, ding, 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 ding. This, it feels hard to believe. Yeah, it feels hard to believe. But there's actually an even more amazing miracle in the book of Jonah. There's more to the story than just him being swallowed by the fish. The more amazing miracle, I think, is actually in chapter 3. Because in chapter 3, this horribly evil, wicked, brutal city, Nineveh, that was one of the major cities in this horrible, evil, brutal nation called Assyria, they actually come to their senses turn from their sin, and God forgives them. Look at the end of the chapter, chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented from the disaster he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This huge city turns from their evil, and God has mercy. That, I think, is a bigger miracle than someone being swallowed by a fish. Because what that shows is that God doesn't just control the kind of supernatural elements in the world, but he actually can change people's hearts. And that's a miracle. Anytime there's a miracle in the scriptures, they're really there to help us ask the question, what does this show us about God? How, what, how does this reveal who God is? How does this reveal what God's like? And so there's two things that Jonah chapter 3 reveals to us here today, and that's where we're going to spend our time, looking at who God is as revealed in this story of Nineveh being awakened and turning from their sin and being forgiven by God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, would you show yourself to us today? Would you open our eyes and our hearts Give us ears to hear who you are. God, whether this is a new story or a very familiar one, would you meet us here in a fresh and a powerful way? We ask in Christ's name, amen. As I said, this story tells us about God. And the first thing this tells us about is God's gracious power. This story tells us about God's gracious power. I want to focus on both of those words. First, God is gracious uh, there's a number of times in this book where uh, it's highlighted that Nineveh is a great city, right? Look at chapter 1, verse 2. It says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out 
against it. In chapter 3, verse 2, almost the exact same wording, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, the message that I tell you. Then in verse 3, it says, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Now, at this point, you're going, well, what made it so great? Was it the club scene, really great restaurants, awesome shows, great infrastructure? No, 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 no. What, what's making it an exceedingly great city is its size. So the fourth place that this phrase is used is in chapter 4, verse 11. This is actually how the book ends. This is where we'll be next week, where having seen Nineveh repent, Jonah's now mad about it because he didn't like these guys. They were his enemies. Now God's had mercy on them, and he's... It's going, God, what's up? How, you, how can you be so forgiving? And here's what God says. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, what makes it a great city, God, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? God looks out at this evil, wicked, brutal city. This place that was known, by the way, if you study history, they were known for skinning people alive who had been captured. They were known for, after they would capture certain people, they would chop off every limb except for their hand so that they could shake their hand in mockery as they died. You know, like the idea of a chain gang, right? Where you have prisoners that are kind of captive and they're all kind of shuffling along together because they're chained together at the feet or at the wrists. Well, Assyria, of which Nineveh was a part, Assyria would often transfer captives, not with chains to their feet, but with fish hooks in their mouths. And the people would all be chained together with these fish hooks. And God looks at that. And he says, chapter 4, verse 11, should I not pity? Should I not have compassion? Should I not have grace? For Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left? See, when God looks at people in rebellion against him, he's not naive. That's why he's going to call out and warn them and say, hey, listen, if things don't change, judgment's coming. If things don't shift here, you're going to be destroyed. But God's initial flinch is to be gracious. You might go, well, How can that be? These people are creative with their cruelty. How can you say they don't know their right hand from their left? Well, this is God's way of saying, like what Jesus said as he hung on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How can God look look at them with such grace? Well, it's because that's who God is. There's this amazing place, and Jonah will actually quote it again next week in chapter 4, but it's this place in Exodus chapter 34 where Moses has asked God to reveal himself, and here's what it says. It says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord The Lord, by the way, when you see that all caps in the Old Testament, that always means Yahweh. It's the personal name of God, Yahweh, Yahweh. Who who is this Yahweh? Who is this Lord? Who is he? Here's who he is. He's a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Who is God? He's merciful. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. Now, that passage will go on to say that he'll by no means clear the guilty, but the emphasis is on God's gracious love, God's gracious power. Maybe you're one of these people who think that actually God likes to bless just the good people. God blesses the people that have their life together. God blesses the people who did well in school. God blesses the people who don't do whatever your parents told you not to do. God just blesses all the good people. But if you actually read the story of Scripture, what you'll find is that God often blesses and has grace on the bad people. That's actually the main people God uses. Abraham, the father of the faith, he was a coward. He actually told someone, hey, this gal, Sarah, she's not my wife, she's my sister. Why don't you go ahead and marry her? Because he was ready to throw her under the bus to save his own skin. And he's the father of the faith. 
You have Moses, the author of the first five books of the Bible, this hero of the faith. And before he's saying boldly, let my people go, he's murdering someone and hiding the body. You have King David, the man after God's own heart, and this man after God's own heart is the one who sees a vulnerable woman taking a bath on her roof while her husband's off at war, and he seduces her, commits adultery, and then conspires to have her husband killed. Read Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, you get the genealogy of Jesus, the people who, who were part of the line of Jesus. You'll find in there Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, all of whom had lots of sexual sin and promiscuity in their life. One of my friends actually preached an Advent sermon once on Matthew 1. He called it Ho, Ho, Ho. (laughs) Maybe not his wisest decision, but it made the point. Who does God mightily use to start the church? Peter. Peter. The one who denied him. The one who said, I don't even know him. Who's the one who's spreading the gospel throughout the Roman world? It's the person who was trying to extinguish the gospel, the Apostle Paul. Listen, the story of God in history is God being gracious to people who don't deserve it, people who cannot earn it, and giving them his love and forgiveness. Some of you are here today and you're thinking, I don't fit here. If if these people knew what's in my past, if these people knew what's in my story, they wouldn't want to sit this close to me. You're thinking, God could never forgive me. Maybe these other people, but not me. And maybe you're thinking, well, maybe God could forgive me, but he could never cleanse me. Like maybe I wouldn't be guilty, but I'd still feel dirty. I don't know if God could really save me. I don't know if God could really do that. Listen, who are you to say to the one who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, who are you to say that he could not save you? That's who God is. God is gracious. And God is not just gracious, but God is powerful. It's one thing for God to want to be loving, to want to be forgiving, to want to be gracious, but what if he didn't have the power to do it? You ever feel powerless? I was thinking, what if I felt powerless? And and the thing that came to mind, and I know not all of you will totally relate to this story, but I remember as a kid playing football, and I would sometimes play running back, and I wasn't particularly good, but I liked it, and occasionally I would get to run the ball, and there were times when as I was being tackled, the ball would come out. I'd fumble it, right? And so the ball would be there on the ground just a couple of yards away, and I would normally be able to just kind of crawl over and grab it. But the worst feeling, if you ever played football, is that feeling of seeing the ball squirt out, and then someone lands on you, and you can't reach it. And it's just right there. Like, it's right there. And you just go, ah! You're, but your arm's, your arm's too short. You can't, you can't get it. You get T-Rex arms all of a sudden, and you just can't, you can't get it. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 59. It says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. God never has this moment where he's like, oh, I fumbled one. I can't get it back. No, God always can get there. Why? Because as it said in Jonah 2.9, salvation belongs to the Lord. Notice the power of God in Jonah chapter 3. You ever heard the idea of a minimum effective dose of medicine? You don't want to take too much ibuprofen, you just want to take enough. The minimum effective dose, because you don't want it to damage your liver, you just want enough to make the headache go away. The minimum effective dose. Well, well, Jonah gives the people of Nineveh a minimum effective dose of sermon. He does not give them much. Look look at what it says, starting in verse uh, 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. By the way, that's big news because last time God told him to do that, he said, I'll go the other way, thanks. Now he's finally obeying. Now Nineveh, it says, when it was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Commentators debate how big that is. What does that mean? It probably means that to really see the city well, you needed three days. 
verse 4, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, right? So he's not going all the way in. He's not touring all the way through it. He's just getting a little bit in. Minimum effective sermon. And he called out. Here's his sermon. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. In the Hebrew, it's five words. Now, probably... He probably said more than that, right? Anytime you read a summary, that probably doesn't mean that's exactly the only words he said. But, but the summary here shows us there's a great deal of detail here, right? This is, a short, this is a short sermon, five words recorded. Some of you are going, maybe you should learn something from him. <laughs> We'd be done by now. But, but, but it's this five-word sermon. Notice, look at it, verse 4. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Look at all that he doesn't tell them about. He doesn't mention God. He doesn't say, hey, here's the list of charges of your sin. He doesn't explain, here's what it would look like to change. It is just a bare minimum sermon, right? He's not spending a great deal of time crafting this thing. He's not trying really hard to be persuasive. And here's the reality. God does not need persuasive preachers to save. God can save as God wants because God is gracious and powerful. His work is on display. It's the word of the Lord that they believe. It's not Jonah. So, some of you are here thinking, well, God could never save me. But others of you, you, God has saved you. And now, what you're thinking is, well, God saved me, and that was amazing, but you know what? He could never save her. He could never save him. So I just want to ask you, who have you written off? Because, yeah, I know God's arm is long, but is it that long? Think about your son. Think about your grandpa. Grandpa. You think about these people at work who just bash Christianity in the church. You think about that person you work with and they're fully kind of all in Mormon. Have you thought God can't save them? Again, I ask you, who are you to say that God's arm is too short to save? Next week, what we're going to look at is really ask the question, are there some people who not only we don't think God could save them, but we don't want him to? Because they've so hurt us, and we're so bitter, and we're so angry, that if God showed them forgiveness, we'd be as mad as Jonah is in chapter 4. But for now, let me just ask you, who have you written off? I mentioned earlier, uh, my, my friend and mentor, Tom Schrader, he, he got saved going to a Bible study that guys at his work had been going to for years, and they never invited him. After he asked, hey, can I go? And he heard the gospel, and he became a Christian. He later asked them, how come you never invited me? And they said, well, we never assumed God could save you. <laughs> God is gracious, and God is powerful. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah 3 shows us that. Second thing that God shows us in Jonah chapter 3 is his generous offer. His generous offer. There's not a great deal of detail here in the sermon, as we've already said that Jonah preaches, but there's enough. There's an implicit warning. Look again. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. In other words, if things continue the way they're going, it's trouble. Nineveh's going down. Now, Now get this. Just think about it. Implicit in a warning is a desire that you would change your behavior and not have to experience that consequence, right? Uh, my dad was a, was a school teacher for many years, and the first few years, he, he, every time he would you know, be off or be sick or whatever, and there'd be a substitute teacher, the kids in his class would just absolutely harass that substitute teacher to the point where they'd never want to come back. And so... Uh, Finally, a couple years in, he, he did this thing. Every time he was going to be gone, he said, listen, I'm going to be gone tomorrow. You better never, these are his sixth graders, you better never, ever, 
ever. Ever. Ever, 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 ever mess with one of my substitutes. And he'd come back two days later, and the note would be from the sub. They were great, <laughs> you know, because he, he, they just knew. Like, he meant business, right? I, this is how my dad was. Like, if there's someone you just know that they mean. Like, I remember my dad, I'm in, I'm in high school, and he's going, I will bare bottom spank you right now <laughs> if you don't change that, right? And I believed him because he was, he did what he said he'd do, right? So I changed my behavior, right? Implicit in this warning is a gracious, generous offer of God. God will by no means clear the guilty. God will, because of his love, exercise wrath and anger and judgment against people who continue to harm his people. That's loving, actually, by the way. Those of you who are moms, you know this. Right? I, the, I remember the, the, a girl that, that kind of dumped me when I was early on in high school. Uh, my mom still hates Kim Hoover. Because <laughs> it's like, you hurt my boy, I'm just always going to be mad at you, right? Because the flip side of love is anger against people who hurt those you love. And I'm like, Mom, we're fine. Like, we're 40 years old now. Like, it's okay. Like, it's okay. You know, like, she's, she's married. It worked out great. I, like, but, but you just, right? Because real love says, I get mad when you hurt those I love. God's the same way. And so it's right for God to be mad. It's right for God to be angry, but it's also generous of God to say, listen, there's time. If you change, if you repent, if you turn, it doesn't have to end this way. Listen, God is pleading with you. It doesn't have to end that way. Your life doesn't have to go down the path that your parents and your uncle and your family went down the road of addiction and alcohol abuse. It doesn't have to go that way. Turn. Your marriage doesn't have to be a statistic. Turn. It doesn't have to go like that. Turn. Repent. That word repent means turn. It's used four times in verses 8 to 10. Turn, turn, turn. Repent, repent, repent. Turn around. You're ruining your life. You are not living in line with the grain of creation. You're fighting against the grain, and it's going south for you. And God loves you so much that he will let you dash your life against the rocks if you do not repent. So there's this warning implicit in the proclamation of judgment and miraculously Nineveh repents they repent they turn now there's questions about well how well did they know God because in this chapter three they never refer to Yahweh it just refers to God and and there's questions historically based on well how long did this last because the book of Nahum is written a hundred years later to say that this didn't last a real long time and God was eventually going to judge Nineveh so there's questions about all that, but there's no question that when God saw what they did, he relented. We see that in verse 10 of chapter 3. So this passage becomes a kind, of, a kind of instruction for us about what it looks like to turn, what it looks like to repent. So here's what I want to walk through for the time that we have here is, is six signs of genuine repentance, genuine turning that we see exemplified by the people here of Nineveh. Here's the first one, is that genuine repentance responds quickly. Genuine repentance responds quickly. Jonah doesn't have to get through the three-day journey, and it doesn't say, and on day 39, at 11.59 p.m., beep, 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 Right, with Jack Bauer there saying, we're running out of time, right? That's not that, right? We're at the last moment they repent. No, 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 right away. They don't need 40 days. Boom. You know what? God is right. This is wicked. This is evil. Let's do something about it. How many of you are waiting? You know what God's telling you to do? You know what obedience would look like? You're holding it off. You're putting it off. Well, someday when we have kids. Well, someday when I'm 
a little more settled in my career, then I'll, well, some, well, you, you tell your kids, I think, what I tell my kids, which is that delayed obedience is disobedience. True repentance doesn't go, well, how close can I get to the point where God's going to judge me before I change? True repentance says, no, I need to do it now. Here's the second thing about genuine repentance is genuine repentance mourns your sin. Look at verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Sackcloth was made uh, sometimes of a kind of burlap material, sometimes of a goat's hair. It was very uncomfortable, right? If you ever, like in field day in elementary school, did you ever do a potato sack race, right, where you kind of teamed up with somebody and you felt that rough thing, right? No one at the end of that was like, can I take this home? Like, this is an amazing shirt. Like, I'm just going to wear this, right? Because it's incredibly uncomfortable. It chafes your skin. It scrapes. And here's the idea of sackcloth. The idea of sackcloth is you're saying, I'm going to physically feel like I emotionally feel. Because emotionally and spiritually, I feel like I'm dead. I'm mourning, I'm grieving, I'm broken, and I'm gonna physically demonstrate this inward brokenness and grief that I feel. I'm, I'm dying here. It's, a, it's mourning. Genuine repentance isn't cavalier about sin. Genuine repentance mourns it. Because I can't believe I did that. I can't believe how I could hurt people like that. I can't believe how I could be so selfish. And there's a grief. There might be tears. There's a burning kind of sorrow. Not that you got caught, but that you did it at all. Or that you failed to do what you should have done. Genuine repentance mourns your sin. It doesn't go, well, you know, I'm sorry if it hurt your feelings. Because you know what, I'm sorry because what I did was wrong whether you felt it or not. Genuine repentance mourns your sin. Third thing we see in this passage is that genuine repentance gets off your own throne. Look at verse six. This is one of my favorite verses here. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. A life apart from God is a life of you sitting on your throne. I know what I want. I know what I need. Everyone else exists to serve me. And when the reality of your sin, and when the reality that there is a God who is holier and bigger and more righteous than you, but yet he's willing to forgive you, when when that reality hits you, you get off your throne and you get on your face. Are you still trying to be on the throne of your life? Like sometimes, like I've seen the bumper stickers say, you know, Jesus is my co-pilot. <laughs> Jesus is the pilot. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the one flying this thing. Genuine repentance gets off your own throne. Fourth, genuine repentance calls out to God in faith. Look, it says in verse five, the people of Nineveh believed God. Well, what was the evidence that they believed God? It was verse eight. Here's what the king tells them. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Genuine repentance doesn't just feel bad. Genuine repentance doesn't just kind of have an internal monologue that goes, oh, I need to change that. Genuine repentance calls out, God, have mercy. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, forgive me. God, I don't deserve it. God, I couldn't earn it, but would you please, please forgive me? I went last night to a Greek Orthodox wedding. I don't know if you've ever been to a Greek Orthodox wedding. It was a really interesting and kind of cool experience. At a Greek Orthodox wedding, if you're in the audience, you stand for like 90% of it. And as part of their liturgy, just this really historic, robust liturgy, and I'll bet a hundred times during that whole, you know, service, I bet a hundred times they said, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I leaned over to Molly at one point and said, Lord, have mercy. Can we sit down? (laughs) Yes. 
But, but I was thinking about it because the Greek Orthodox Church, they trace their roots back to the apostles. And that liturgy doesn't like get updated every couple years. It's kind of been that way for a long time. And so from the earliest part of the church, even at a wedding, there was this awareness. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God, forgive us. God, cleanse us. God, wash us. Not a confidence that we have it all together, but a calling out, a pleading with God, Lord, have mercy. Genuine repentance, fifth, changes behavior. Doesn't just feel bad, doesn't just pray quietly, but actually changes your behavior. Look again at verse eight. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. The king says, listen, y'all, we can mourn this thing and we can pray that God will forgive us, but we gotta stop it. Turn from it. He doesn't dispute, well, technically, God, I don't know if what you think is sin is actually sin because... He didn't argue. He said, you know what, God, you're right. His conscience is nailed. You're right, God. We gotta turn from this. We gotta change this. Let me ask you, are you actually turning from the sin that you say you're repenting of? So I think a lot of times when, when we struggle with something and someone will ask us as they pray for us or hold us accountable, they'll go, well, hey, have you repented? And what they're, and we go, yeah. But what we mean is, well, I, I knew it was bad. I felt bad about it. I prayed for forgiveness. That's not full repentance. Repentance means now you change. Now you start some new habits. Now you do some new things that replace that thing. It doesn't mean you do it perfectly. It doesn't mean you never fall again. But it means if you're doing the same sin over and over and over and over and over, and you Feel bad about it over and over and over and over. That's great that you feel bad, but it's time to repent. It's time to change. It's time to turn. You go, well, I've tried. I don't have the power. Exactly. Which is why you need the spirit. This is why it's a spiritual reality that God has to give you the power to truly repent. And finally, genuine repentance, I love this, doesn't feel entitled to forgiveness. I love the response of verse 9. After laying all this out, look at how the king finishes it. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Right? Notice the king does not go, well, listen, y'all, here's how it works. If we put on the sackcloth, if we call out to the Lord the right way, if we make sure to keep our animals away from the food, I'm not sure why that matters. If we, if we, if we, then God will, because then God will owe us, because then God has to. That's not what he said. He said, all right, here's the plan. We're going to mourn, we're going to pray, we're going to change, and who knows? Maybe God will be merciful. Isn't that such a different idea than the idea that says, well, if I do these things and if I pray this prayer and if I do it this way, then God owes me. He's got to forgive me. And so do you. You owe me forgiveness. That's not how it works. Genuine repentance says, I don't deserve to be forgiven. If I were God, I probably wouldn't forgive me, but maybe God is more gracious and merciful than I am, and so God have mercy. That's genuine repentance. It responds quickly, it mourns your sin, it gets off your throne, it calls out to God in faith, it changes behavior, and it's not entitled to have forgiveness. Now, here's the final exhortation. Have you ever been to a restaurant and uh, the person next to you got their food and it just looked way better than yours? And you were like, dang it, they out-ordered me. Right? You got out-ordered. Here, here's the exhortation. Don't get out-repented by the Ninevites. That's what Jesus warns about when he comes on the scene many years later. The Jews come to him and they go, hey, we want a sign. Give us a sign. He says, I'm not going to give you a sign except for the sign of Jonah, 
who was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And just as he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so I'm going to be in the grave three days, and I'll rise three days later. And here's what he says. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the last day and condemn this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and you haven't. Don't be out-repented by the people of Nineveh. There's no indication that they embrace the covenant. There's no indication that they began the sacrificial system or embrace circumcision or all these other things that would have made them the true worshipers of Israel's God. There's no indication of that. And yet their repentance was enough that it staved off God's disaster. Don't be out-repented by the Ninevites. But look to Jesus. He's the gracious, powerful one who looked out over a great city and wept and then died to save her. He's the one who will forgive. He's the one who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, full of grace and truth. And he will receive you if you will come to him in faith. Let's pray. Father, you are, you are right to be angry at our sin. When we live selfishly, when we hurt one another, when we're indifferent toward you and the people made in your image, God, you are right to be angry. You are right to give us judgment. And so we thank you for Jesus, the one who absorbed judgment so that we could be free, the one who was full of grace and truth. God, fill us with the power to repent. It's your kindness, Romans says, that leads us to repentance. God, grant us the ability to turn. And thank you that when we do, you are gracious and powerful to save. We pray in Christ's name, amen.